big welcome everyone. I always feel like uh, it's, it's kind of a joke, but it's so actually functionally true that, you know, we get to spend an hour and a half on a Friday night keeping the heart's capacity for love in mind. And uh, it may sound like, well, <laughs> must be nothing on the TV or something like that, that this is all that we have left to do. But I think it's really fair to say that turning the mind, turning the heart toward this capacity to be kind and generously, fully good, turning our attention in this direct way is, I think, the most available source of happiness in our lives. And uh, the takeaway for me, whenever I find an opportunity to, like when we gather as a community, you know, we support each other because we have the shared intention to check out, okay, so let me put my attention in this way. Let me keep my capacity for friendliness and love in mind. And let me notice what, what's the act, actual effect on my body, my mind and heart. And when we think about what else we might do in an hour and a half, scrolling through the internet, you know, whatever it might be, this has real resonance. It really changes, literally, I know it sounds a bit dramatic, but I think it really changes the course of our lives. Now, the, uh, I always like to mention that to do this practice means we have to begin with some amount of faith or confidence that this heart that's here now, this whatever it is, we don't even have a good definition of what we mean by the mind, the heart, this life. But we need some faith that it's capable of recognizing and abiding in this generous goodness that we call metta, this basic goodness or friendliness the benevolence of the heart. And then once through that act of faith, like, oh yeah, I think this heart, I know, you know, from past experience, I've recognized this goodness. There's no reason for me to think that it's not here now, not available now. Like, did you break it? <laughs> oh, I dropped my capacity for love and now it's broken, doesn't work anymore. Right? So it's just a matter of that initial confidence, which, ins which inspires uh, uh, a specific alertness, like we're curious, where, how might that capacity for love express itself in a moment like this? How might I recognize it here and now? And then when we do recognize it here and now, <clears throat> whether we bring a memory to mind that sort of reminds us of this capacity for this generous quality of love, kindness, then how do we keep it in mind? So there's a lot happening in any moment, but we're going to do our best to keep it in mind, keep it in mind, keep it in mind. So it's really a bulk of the formal metta, loving kindness meditation is that real art of keeping this generous goodness of the heart in mind, not forgetting it, not forgetting it, keep it in mind, keep it in mind. And then noticing there's a cause, there's a, you know, something happens when we keep it in mind. It grows, it deepens, it broadens. It, it has this nature to expand and fill the space of the moment. So we talk about it, it's, 
you know, these are words, so it doesn't quite capture it, but we talk about it filling the space of the body, for example, or filling the space of the room or spilling over and going out to our loved ones and the cat in the corner and the dog there and the neighbor over there and the good friend. And the, so we have this sense with our ideas and memories and images of it filling the space of the whole world. But actually what's happening, we're just coming, we're becoming clear about the actual experience of that generosity of love. And there's a word in Buddhism which gets translated as boundless. And, and the thing to really recognize is that all inclusive flavor. So we're here tonight, you know, we're gonna sit, I'll give some instructions once we get started. But we're here to, initially with some confidence, yeah, I, I think I've felt, I've experienced that full and generous quality of my heart before. So I know I'm capable, this heart is capable of it. So that I should be able to find my way back. I'm willing to experiment to see whatever might create a way back or to uncover that. And then I'm gonna keep it in mind. And I'm gonna specifically and keep it in mind, notice that boundless, generous, expansive, full quality of love. And then I'll give some more instructions near the end of the sit, like what we can do with that quality to you know, just let it follow its natural course, which is a deeper and even deeper healing, as healing as that experience of a deeper, broader love is. It's even a greater healing when that expansiveness of love really allows wisdom to realize the heart that is temporarily free of grasping, of needing things to be different than they are. So it's a more refined piece that we can open to. So that's just a little bit of an introduction. So we'll be sitting for about 35 minutes or so. It's really nice to take the time now as you're settling to listen to your body. This creature, our body really is the most proximate expression of wilderness. You know, we may think that we love the ocean or we love the boundary waters in Northern Minnesota or the Canyon lands in Southwestern United States or the woods or whatever, but we have this body right here. It's our own local wilderness. And we come into the body, make friends with it. If you're comfortable, you can let the eyes close. Feeling the wildness of the body of sensation. And just doing your best to cultivate a very honest, sincere relationship with the body, being real with the body. Even just this is a beautiful quality of love, willing to relate to the body, to meet the body, to be with the body, to accept the body as it is come into relationship with the body. Not our idea of the body, but the very real dynamic of the body here as a flow of sensation. And you can just have a sense of a generous smile towards your body, perhaps. And as you breathe in, it's this really generous yes to the body. And you can even use that word with each in-breath. 
a very generous, magnanimous yes to the body. And as you exhale each time, you can just offer the body a simple wish. It might be the word ease or peace or love. So again, as you breathe in, repeating a word like yes, generous acceptance. And as you breathe out, offering a simple the generous wish to the body, ease or release, something like that. So try that for a couple minutes. You're just letting the body be washed over bathed by the glorious yes as we breathe in and the very generous ease release as we exhale. Every part of the body is in a sense, in a real sense is touched by the wholesome vibration of this generosity. It's a great gift to be showing up to the body in this generous way. as if the whole body is breathing in with the big yes, this is how it is and it's okay. And the big generous wish for ease, wish for release, the warm smile as you exhale. And don't worry if the body feels like twisted steel or if there's some discomfort. Breathing in with a generous yes, this is how it is. It's like this sometimes. Wishing you ease, dear friend, as you exhale. And when we wish the body ease or wish the body peace or release, of course, we understand that the body is just expressing its own causes and conditions and our generous wish for ease. It's just a beautiful thing, but it doesn't necessarily change the sensations in the body, but it's still a generous, beautiful wish. So don't be disappointed or frustrated. Just keeping this generous love in mind as you breathe in, as you breathe out. Keep it simple.
being aware, and even being the love as you breathe in, being the generous love as you breathe out, this light and inclusive, non-averse quality of the heart as you breathe in, as you breathe out. And if you don't need any words, then let the words fall away. And we're just keeping in mind this generous quality of love as you breathe in, breathe out, feeling it right here, right now, in the body, in the tender, sensitive heart right at the middle. And as we get some momentum in terms of keeping love in mind, this quality of metta, friendliness, notice how it includes the body, includes the beautiful heart, this heart right here that's sensitive. Feel so much so much goodness, so much difficulty. And other beings will come to mind, people who are here on Zoom with us, dear friends, pets. You don't have to necessarily bring different people, different beings to mind. Better to keep in mind this generous quality of love, kindness, friendliness, and how it naturally includes nothing's left out, everything in front, to the right, behind, to the left, above and below, everywhere and every way. I will abide pervading the all-encompassing world with this generous heart of love, abundant, exalted, boundless, free from all aversion, free from craving. I will abide. It's a very simple and beautiful gift all around to ourselves, to all beings. Just this willingness to care, to wish well, 
And again, you may not need any phrases or words. So we'll continue for a while in silence now. And just go back to the breath and the phrases when you need to. Learning how to abide in this generosity of the heart we call metta, love, basic goodness. Really trust this quality of the heart to learn to rest in it and allow it to have its healing effect. It's love for its own sake.
We're simply doing our best to keep metta, loving kindness in mind, this actual generosity of the heart. And when we lose the thread, then begin again. Care about this body, willing to be generously present with the body just as it is, with this sensitive heart, this life here, with those around me. So one way or another, creatively, find your way back. Use your confidence in your heart's capacity to express goodness, goodwill. And then keeping that in mind, keeping it in mind. Noticing the particular generous quality of kindness. It's expansive quality. Like a beautiful light that shines generously in all directions. Feeling the fullness or boundlessness of these qualities of the heart. Beautiful welling up, giving away. May all beings be happy and at ease. Without exception, may all beings be happy and at ease. And even though I know people's happiness depends on so many causes and conditions, but still this wish, may all beings be happy and at ease.
and we're learning to abide in that generous yes of the heart, filling the space with that warmth, that fullness of love in all directions, above and below. Nothing's left out. I'm really sensing how healing and functional it is to be friendly in this generous and universal sense. A generous smile that includes everything. Don't worry if you notice patterns of resistance, reactivity. Let them happen and see if you can relate to that resistance, that reactivity in a generous way. Oh yeah, this is happening. This can belong to, it's like this sometimes. In a sense, that warm and generous smile, the inner smile of the heart, it receives, it relates to the resistance in a kind way. In the same way, if we bring to mind somebody who's really been an irritant in our life, do we really need to become defended Do we really need to have the heart get caught up in ill will? Or is there a way to maintain this generosity of kindness, even when these thoughts come up? And from abiding in this generous, full quality of love, just sensing the space, the vast open space of the mind, the knowing mind. That sense of space and balance Appreciate this 
quiet space, the space of the present moment. Notice its flavor of equanimity, really beautiful, radiant balance. And the absence of any ill will, any resistance. So really beautiful openness, balanced openness. And just see if you can abide in this more subtle, quiet space of the heart. So adjust your body. We'll take a, a few minutes now. There may be people, as uh, those of you who remember coming to the center when we did the loving kindness practice group in person, we usually took some time at this point where people might want to bring somebody to mind, somebody who might appreciate our good wishes or somebody who has some joy in their life that might appreciate us appreciating their joy. And so it might be you bring somebody, you just in a sentence or two, just not uh, maybe just using a person's first name or no name at all. And then pause, we'll all pause. And we'll just reflect and send that person some good wishes for a moment. And then somebody else can speak up. So uh, just pay attention if someone is unmuting themselves the same time you are, just to yield or take turns so that we don't get in the way of somebody else sharing. Anybody want to begin? Anybody you feel like, and it could be yourself, of course, that you just want to bring out explain the situation in one or two sentences. And then we just pause and silently each of us holding, sending love, something like that. Who'd like to begin?
I'd like us to think of John, a friend, my daughter's partner who had a stroke a couple of almost two months ago and has just come home and is doing uh, pretty well. And I'd like to bring to mind all of us who in little or big ways might be caught up in divisiveness and fear and judgments and feeling judged around the politics swirling in our country. And just this resonant wish for deep, the deepest healing so that we can meet and connect and understand each other and find ways to take care of everyone. So may this be so. I'd like to bring to mind an immediate family member um, that's currently in inpatient uh, treatment right now for addiction. Um, thoughts of loving kindness and well wishes and healing for them and strength. I'd like to bring up my six year old grandson and all the children who can't be with friends who are feeling very isolated and lonely and um, may they know love through this all. I'd like to bring up my friend Alma in Mexico who um, her daughter-in-law died of COVID the other night and she's taking care of their children. I'd like to send Meta to my friend Rick who just um, just lost his father um, to cancer and a childhood friend to cancer was an immediate sort of you know two day long diagnosis and just um, found out his mother actually is also has a cancer diagnosis right now so he's a little bit overwhelmed and so any any kind of energy and love for for him and his family also for my my nephew who's in, who's quarantined and missing his football and choir and things like that. And hopefully he'll stay healthy because his sister who just went away to college this year um, has had COVID for the last couple of weeks now. And as we continue to listen to everybody, we're realizing the heart that can hold it all. Like that's really the practice as we listen to people speak into the space. Please go on, anybody who'd like to go. I'd like to send Mecca to my friend Sam and Shana. Shana just lost her brother to alcoholism and they need a lot of love and support right now. So just think of them and send them Mecca. Thank you. Mm. Sending metta and compassion for everyone who is locked away in jails and prisons right now and unable to receive um, visitors, including the regular education programs or recovery leaders that 
come in and lead lead groups. Um, so sending them love as they're experiencing a, a whole nother layer of isolation. And we have a little bit more time if there's anybody else that you'd like to bring in. I just want to send a message to the, all the homeless and, and hungry um, citizens of our nation, but mostly, you know, that are in here around us and in our parks and and in our neighborhoods, um, not having anywhere to go to, to keep warm and, and have a, you know, have a meal to speak of. Uh, too many of them. And so we'll end this part of our evening by just using our imagination and sensing all the people and all the creatures and the planet itself, all the actual real joys, all the beauty and all the suffering, the ill will, the oppression, the mean-spiritedness and the fear. Nothing left out, we hold, find ourselves right in the middle of the whole, all the beauty, all the horror. And we practice being in the middle in this generous, this sensitive, full, open-hearted way. So we're learning how to relate to the totality of the moment in a generous, loving way, fearless way, without any need for ill will. Doesn't mean we have answers or we figured it all out. But still it's really profoundly healing to realize that we don't need ill will. We don't need fear and ill will. We can be right in the middle with the heart free from ill will. I'm going to put my earbuds back in. Maybe I'll leave them out. Maybe Wynn is here with me, so I want her to be able to hear as well. So I'll see. Let me know if you can't hear me, and I'll put them back in. But if you can hear me, okay, I'll leave them off. And most of you know we have this time now just to discuss together. I'll get us started by sharing a few thoughts, but hopefully that will inspire other people to reflect. I often say, you know, at this uh, time we discuss, we're just basically tapping into what we've learned about love and just functionally, when we have an attitude of love, how does that work for us? And when we have attitudes of ill will, well, how does that work for us? And just on that really basic level, because we, 
you know, we often, I think wrongly think that the attitude that I have is a given. So if we're frustrated or if we're feeling that I'm no good, I don't deserve happiness or whatever, whatever that attitude might be, it, it seems like, well, that's just who I am right at that moment. And uh, part of what we're trying to open up to in our practice is that attitude is always in play. It's not a fixed thing. And that's part of this deep misunderstanding of self. The idea of self is that we think there's a somebody who is some way, like there's a Mark who's frustrated or there's a Mark who's defensive or there's a Mark who's happy. But what we're, you know, we're not saying there isn't a self as much as we're understanding what we mean by self, right? It's a changing constellation of emotion and thought and sensation. It's a changing dynamic. And when we understand that self isn't a fixed permanent entity, then what skillfulness is all about is learning how to participate in this dynamic we call me, you know, the self, so that I can move through life more and more often in a generous and friendly way, kind way. And just seeing, experiencing directly how functional that is. And, and the more we begin to see the nimbleness of attitude, the more clear we get about these particular habits, vortexes of attitude that we get stuck in. And part of what makes them so sticky is that when we're in that particular vortex, like for me, it might be, you know, a little being defensive in some way. Um, because th there's that there that what makes it sticky is that sense that there's a there really is a guy who you know hasn't been taken care of people aren't doing their part who's all alone i mean th there are these particular stories that each of us you know they're different for each of us and people could even share tonight if if it feels safe appropriate you know some of our stories that have that real stickiness. Like even now with the space and protection of the teachings and gathering like this, we might bring up something like that, like one of our central stories. And even though we know better, it does feel sort of true. And it is sort of true in a way. And it's just a story. It's not the whole truth. And one of the ways that love really loosens things up is when we recognize these vortexes where we tend to get sticky, we can also recognize, you know what, that's a little, that's an oppressive story for me to be embedded in. And I care about that. I care about how seductive, how sticky that story, you know, like an oh poor me story or I'm not good story. I was listening, uh, Wynn and I were listening to a podcast, part of a podcast earlier that Shannon, one of Cumberland's leaders sent me and uh, Brene Brown, some of you know, a well-known sort of spiritual teacher in our bigger, she's not, I don't know if she'd consider herself Buddhist, but a lot of her ideas are definitely similar to the ideas in Buddhism um, about like really getting to know our vulnerability is one of the things she's often talked about. But anyway, she has a podcast and she was interviewing, and I'm forgetting his last name, Vikram. He was, I think, the Surgeon General under President Obama. And I think he's part of the leadership team now with the, Bi the new Biden administration that's getting put together. And he has a book about loneliness that just came out. And so she was interviewing him around about loneliness and... Uh, but just that, like, what's behind the loneliness, this habit to feel lonely? And often it's this, uh, 
you know, uh, there's something related to belonging, you know, and do we deserve to, it, you know, it often begins with our own relationship to our, to ourselves and to the moment. And this, you know, as people who are in, into mindfulness practice, this is something we have to come to grips with early. I'm about to go on a five week retreat. I'll be teaching the first two weeks of my retreat. I'll be out at Prairie Farm Common Grounds Retreat Property in Western Wisconsin for five weeks. And like I said, I'll be teaching for first two weeks. So I'll ease into the silence. And then the last three weeks, I'll just be in silence um, on retreat. But I noticed like, uh, you know, and I'm somebody for, I don't know how many years now, but getting close to 40 now <laughs> years of, you know, a lot of retreat practice, cumulatively many years of retreat practice. And still there's a little fear about like, just being with me, <laughs> just being with my mind, just being with my body, you know, not having my entertainments and my diversions and whatever. And uh, so part of our, you know, our loving kindness practice is, well, what is my relationship with my heart, my life, my experience, the here and now? Because this is where we really begin to address the deeper roots of something like loneliness is, well, why can't we have a generous, a kind, and even an enlivening relationship with our own experience? And then if somebody comes in to that experience, great. And if nobody is able or whatever is able to come in, that's no problem because it's already an enlivening relationship. Another thing from that talk that I found useful too was, you know, just in understanding our relationship with ourselves, our relationship with others. And the whole practice is about seeing everything in terms of the heart relating. And is that way of relating about somebody needing something, they, in that podcast, we're talking about self-validation, or is that relationship about dana, about giving? and being generous. That's why you probably noticed in the guided meditation, I probably used the word generosity or generous 30 times. Cause it really, it really paints or gives an, a sense of that giving away that opening up that not being in need. And you know, that's a very compelling story cause as a creature on this planet, we're cold and we're in need of heat and we're hungry and we're in need of food and we're lonely and we're in need of affection and we're, you know, hurting and we're in need of relief from our pain and so many other things. But we don't have to, that sort of creature existence isn't the sum total of what's happening, right? Because we can understand our life we can in a sense see our creaturely life and we can care about it. And we can see all the other creatures around us and we can care about them. And that's, that has a different feeling. That has that generous and full feeling as opposed to that seeking something, seeking to get something. So it's like, you know, I'm thinking about this in terms of going on a five week retreat and like, uh, am I going to fix something to get something or am I going to, to have many, 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 many moments, right? Five weeks, there are a lot of moments, but each one, any one of those moments can be a really generous moment. Like even walking into the bathroom, touching the doorknob, swinging the door, walking into, that can be done with a lot of generosity, a lot of fullness, a lot of love. Or it can be done as somebody who needs something. I need to pee so I can get on to the next thing. Oh yeah, there's a virus. I need to watch what I touch. And, you know, so there's, 
there's different attitudes, different ways of relating. One that's needy and tight and one that's generous and full. So that's what I'll say to get the conversation going. Maybe some of that evokes some other thoughts and experiences you'd like to share with the group, or maybe it wasn't clear at all and you wanna go off in another direction, that's okay too. But uh, go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, yeah, just maybe say your first name, feel free to say your pronouns if you'd like, so we don't misgender you if we respond to your comments. Yeah, and then just share how, what are you learning in your life about love as an attitude, as a way of relating versus any sort of normal, more normal, aversive, controlling way of relating to our experience, our lives, each other, what comes to mind? Feel free also to ask questions about the practice if any have come to mind. Yeah, I really appreciate the powerful teachings. Thanks so much, Carol. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. Some of you may be noticed uh, uh, Scotty Hall and uh, Cecilia Ramon and Shelley Graff and I are going to lead a workshop tomorrow on belonging and othering. And it's a lot of what Charlie was just talking about, getting curious just as a frame, using that frame of othering and belonging as we just social, you know, just move through social life. And just noticing, like even surprising, like even though we're just seeing each other as these little rectangle photographs and hearing voices sometimes, but still like, oh, there will be little thoughts of I belong, I'm the same as that person. In Buddhism, we call them conceits. You know, whenever we uh, use that comparing mind where we're grouping hierarchically or any way of grouping, I'm, you know, that person we're the same or we're different, they belong, they don't belong. And just to notice that part of the mind, like Charlie was talking about, is so interesting. And, you, you know, it's not easy to get ourselves out of it, except to notice that capacity for love. And it, it sort of, it's not like we stop discerning or stop having preferences or stop noticing difference but there's something that holds the whole thing, which is that basic attitude of kindness, that generous attitude of kindness. And it, and it really, um, it can supersede these self-centered notions like, uh, yeah, it's, it's just the form of self-importance. Like, well, if I'm gonna date somebody, you know, I only wanna date somebody that makes sense in terms of my story, which is I'm a Buddhist, 
I want to end up with another Buddhist. Why even bother to get to know anybody who's not self-identifying as a Buddhist? I mean, that sounds sort of oppressive, even though it makes a lot of rational sense. I mean, you know, it, I could see our, my mind for sure thinking in that way. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. Who'd like to go next? Yeah, and somehow just like what in what you were saying, when we're too busy dealing with the difficulties and the threats and the irritants, we miss that picture. So there's something about, I mean, and I think this is so important in our spiritual life generally, like it really is important that we learn how to feel good because when we feel good, we have a much more balanced way of seeing everything. And then we can meet it, you know, but when we're just, uh, I don't know if people know the archetype of the hungry ghost, it's a image in Buddhist, in sort of the Buddhist cosmology of beings that have this insatiable hunger, that a mouth the size of a pinhole, so they can never appease their hunger. And they just live their lives, you know, trying to get, trying to have. And, uh, and when we're so busy trying to feed our hunger, we don't notice the beauty and we don't notice all the suffering. And so we live lonely lives, desperately trying to feed, never able to feed in a way that totally is satisfying. Sound familiar? Because this is what we do. I mean, I, I really see that like when I'm, not the first minutes, but after several minutes of being on the internet and reading the news or whatever I'm doing, and then it's like less and less interesting stuff. And, and that subtle kind of desperation to the mind wanting something interesting to read or to look at, you know? And then I notice that I'm reading actually even more and more superficially the articles I do look at uh, because there's like the mind is sort of conditioned to think, okay, there's not gonna be anything interesting here, go on. <laughs> and it's this like perfect metaphor for the hungry ghost, you know, this sort of insatiable thirst for some sort of pleasantness. And this is what I said right at the beginning of the group tonight, this capacity we all have, it's really a universal capacity to be relating to our body and our experience in a generous and kind way, it's pleasant. The moment may not be pleasant, but relating to the moment in that kind and generous way is an inner pleasure. And it, and it breaks the spell of the hungry ghost because we feel a little bit better, be, not because the moment's changed, but because we're relating not with ill will, but with kindness. But it's subtle, that pleasure of kindness, that kind attitude, that's a relatively subtle pleasure, but it's real. Just because it's subtle doesn't make it not real. And it really changes everything. When we start to feel good in that inner sense, you know how it is, everything looks a little different. We have time for one more comment if there's somebody that would like to share something before we end our time together. What else have you been learning in your life in this area? Yeah, it's a good, really good question. 
And, you know, I think we probably all have tastes or intuition of this space where the heart feels settled or resolved or not fragmented, but for no good reason. Like when we get a nice massage or a nice hug from a dear friend or then, then we'll feel good, but there's a real definite reason. Oh yeah, this happened and now I feel good. But, but one of the things like in meditation and just generally on the path that we run into is that sense of being whole for no good reason. Like the surface of my personality, there might be a lot of neurotic tendencies that have been triggered, right? But there's something like that is not having a problem with my knee hurting and, and feeling neurotic and irritated by this and that, right? So that sense of, uh, it really shocks um, the idea that there's a somebody that has to get somewhere before we're going to be safe or before we're going to be healed. And it really changes what refuge is. Like in Buddhism, that's why we use that word awakening. We're awakening to something that's here and now. We're not on the spiritual path to go from being an ignorant spiritual seeker and then tra traversing the spiritual path and then ending up at the top of the mountain where we're perfect or something like that. The path is really about waking up or realizing what's here and now. And it's here and now when we're starting and it's here and now when we're a seasoned practitioner, it's not different. We're not getting somewhere. We're just understanding what this is. So the more we intuit that there isn't a problem, then, then the whole world the resolution, it's all like right here. It doesn't really work well in words though. So <laughs> sorry if it's not making any sense, but, uh, but the experience is really, um, yeah, it's, it really changes how we live because we realize that our relationships as beautiful as they are, as difficult as they are, it's not what it's about. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't be in relationship because it's not about the relationship. Does it, just in the same way, it doesn't mean we shouldn't buy a cabin, even though we know having a cabin isn't gonna make us happy or getting back in another relationship or learning to be okay living alone. You know, we still have to, and we're still going to live our life, but now we do it not because I need something, we can do it in this generous way. So, you know, when you're having the alone time this winter because of COVID and because of your new living status, you know, well, how can that be a beautiful thing? And when you fall in love and decide to live with another person, how can that be a beautiful thing? Thanks, Anna, for sharing with us. And we should probably leave it here. I'm just gonna put on this in the chat, um, let's just do the one stanza with loving kindness. Some of you know this as the four quarters chant or the suffusion with the divine abidings. And I really love this because it's how the Buddha taught loving kindness practice. And let's not chant it. Let's just do it as a reflection and you can just read it silently. I'll read it out loud. But the idea is to do the reflection. So I'll do it a little bit slowly. I will abide pervading one quarter what's in front of us with the heart imbued with love, with kindness. Same with the second quarter to my right, third quarter behind, fourth quarter to the left, above, below, all around, everywhere, and to all as to myself. I will abide pervading the all encompassing world with this heart imbued with kindness, abundant, exalted, 
immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. And thanks everyone for your sharings and your wisdom. Really appreciated hearing from folks. And nice to be with everyone. Feel free to join in for the workshop tomorrow. There's still plenty of space. It's actually a relatively small group. So if you'd like to reflect on othering and belonging, join in. I'll be doing a day long at the end of November, that Saturday after Thanksgiving. I'll be out at Prairie Farm, but joining in, I think that may be almost the last thing I teach before the more formal part of my retreat. And then uh, Shelly and Gabe will be leading the um, community practice intensive in December. It's like two and a half weeks. I think it begins the first Monday night in December where, um, yeah, you can read about it. It should be in the public calendar already. And then there's the year end retreat when Fricky is able to join us for that. So it'll be Shelly Graff, Win Fricky and myself. And I, I believe that Stacy McClendon may be joining, assisting that retreat. And that's the 27th of December through 12 noon on the 31st. So about four days, I think. And lots of other things coming up as well. Really nice to be with everyone tonight. Wishing you all well. Bye-bye.